Ladies and gentlemen, let's read game instead of common video. Let's discuss Intel Skylake, or more specifically, some benchmarks that have surfaced. Now, if they're accurate, it paints an interesting picture of just how Skylake is going to perform in the desktop market space. Now, I would love to include the slides in the video, but because they're leaks and if they're accurate, I imagine Intel are probably not too happy. But I've linked them in an article in the video description if you do want to check them out. But we're going to discuss them anyway. But um, anyway, so let's start, shall we? So to get everyone onto the same page, I'm pretty sure all of you know this anyway, but good to just reiterate. Skylake is, of course, the successor to Haswell. And it's pretty pretty understood by now that Haswell um, had about a 10% improvement in performance over, say, Ivy Bridge. And Ivy Bridge enjoyed a 10% improvement over um, the... Uh, the favourite among many, and m many people would have still haven't really upgraded from, Sandy Bridge. But, Skylake S was touted by many, and expected by many, to hit about 20%. It's not doing that, judging from these benchmarks. Now, the je benchmarks actually originate from PCFRM. So, they're, you know, how accurate they are, I don't know. But, if they are accurate, they basically put the CPU um, just ever so slightly above Devil's Canyon. So here's, here's the deal. It's about 15% improvement IPC, in other words, per clock. So in other words, if the two CPUs are running at the same clock speed. So for example, 3D Mark's CPU score, you've got 11,515 for the 6700K, which of course is, um, is Skylake. Whereas an i7 4790K uh, is one is ten thousand one hundred. Whereas if you were to look at say the 5820K, you're looking at eleven thousand nine hundred and forty. Obviously because of the additional threads helping out. PC Mark V2 um, 6700 wins. It's got 5908 versus the Devil's Canyon or uh, 4790K at 5679. And this trend continues, for example, in Cinebench, which, of course, is multi-thread intensive. This is R15. You're looking at 10.53 on the 6700K, whereas the 5820K hits uh, 10.78, whereas the 4790 is 9.23, and so on and so forth. So... There are some problems I've got with this, and I have included a um, table with the article, if you want to check it out, with all of the different CPUs that have been announced. Now, there are two unlocked ones, which are the 6700K and the 6600K, and those are the ones that I'm primarily going to be discussing in this video. Now, in terms of core, they are the same. In other words, they're the same as 2500K, they're the same as the... Um, or 2600k I guess all the way down the Haswell line as well in other words you've got the four cores eight threads with the 6700k and the 6600k you've got four CPU cores which handle four threads because they don't have hyper threading and their base clock is uh, 3.5 gigahertz boosting up to 3.9 for the 6600k and the 6700k is 4 gigahertz based boosting up to 4.2 now, this is actually a little slower than Devil's Canyon, which, by the way, gets up to 4.4. Now, the reason I say that this is a little weird and this is an odd situation is if you ignore the fact that it's being die shrunk and if you ignore the fact that, obviously, in some applications, you're certainly going to be getting a nice boost in performance. In other words, applications which are written specifically to take advantage of the additional instructions or Skylake strengths, I guess you could say, for example, updated ABX, 512-bit registers, blah, blah, blah. For many, it's going to be a question of, hmm, and, and this is my opinion, this is not fact, this is based on the leaks, and this is my opinion, but it's, it's a really odd situation because... Let's say you're the proud owner of a 4790 or even a 4770K. Regardless, let's just say you're, you know, the owner of one of those. Is it really going to be worth it on an average 15% in performance increase if you're going to have to buy an entire new motherboard, an entire new DDR4 setup? 
maybe. I guess it depends. Um, the the really the the bizarre thing, of course, for many is that we know that DirectX 12 is going to be out. So, am I saying that you should wait? Well, it depends. If if these results are accurate, and I stress if because we don't know. But let's assume just for a moment that they are accurate. Well, you've got this odd position in the market now where you've got, let's say, the 5820K, which is really good for those who are interested in multi-threading, and obviously you've got the others in the, the same 500, the 5000 range, and, you know, it's really good for those in multimedia, power users, and so on, and then, of course, you've got the, the 4000 series, or even, let's say, the Ivy Bridge, or the um, even the Sandy Bridge, I guess, which are great for gamers. But this, it's it's pretty much the same old, the same old. So I think many are going to say to themselves, mm, is it really worth me upgrading for 15% increase in performance? I guess it depends um, on things such as how well do they overclock and so on. The other situation you've got to remember as well is AMD are going to be most likely releasing their own CPU in 2016. Now the Zen, from what we've seen is going to be pretty good. Um, I'm basing this once again on the rumours, and I'm basing this once again on speculation, but assuming the block diagrams that have leaked onto the internet are pretty accurate, it's going to be a lot better intro to performance. Float performance is going to be pretty interesting as well, and moreover, single thread performance is going to go up through the roof, but the reason I think it's going to be kind of cool from the perspective of PC gamers. We've heard many tweets, we've heard many opinions, and we've seen the graphics overhead testing with DirectX 12. It's pretty obvious to anyone that DirectX 12 is going to be benefit from multi-threading. I don't think I need to tell you that, but, you know, it, it's going to benefit, and it's certainly not the only API that's going to. Vulkan, of course, is as well. You've got Mantel. In other words, more CPU cores are good. So for the high-end, the bleeding-edge gamers, the ones who do or will be taking advantage, in other words, there won't be GPU, um, they won't be necessarily GPU limited because they'll be going for like, I'm obviously just pulling this out of my butt, but like a 390X, um, maybe Crossfire setup or the 395X2 or possibly a GTX, uh, 980 Ti SLI, maybe, you know, you have two or three of those cards in SLI, which of course some gamers will have, you've got the question of, well, okay, is four CPU cores going to be enough to power that? Maybe. But with Zen, of course, we're looking at four minimum, and then up to eight or even more. I'm not necessarily saying that Intel are going to be at a disadvantage. Please don't get me wrong. Please don't misconstrue my... Um, opinions, I'm just saying that I'm a little disappointed if this is accurate and I, in terms of the performance boost. I'm a little disappointed. I'm not terribly disappointed. It's it's better than it could have been, but it's also worse than what I have liked. The biggest problem for me, however, is I really wish Intel would have included more cores for the 6700K. I really would have liked to have seen six CPU cores with hyper-threading. Um, or at least the option for a better one and kind of adjust the marketplace pricing. That's just my opinion, um, you know, based on it. And obviously we we are going to have other processors available. Um, for example, you've got the Broadwell e-chips which are coming out. Uh, those are scheduled to be released in 2016. And then of course you've got the Skylake successor known as Cannon Lake. Or you may know it as well as Skymont, that's Sky and then M-O-N-T, which is a tick. So it's basically going to be a die shrink of Skylake. So that's 14 NM down to just 10 NM. There are going to be some other architectural changes, of course, most likely. But what those are, I don't know. Um, no one knows at the moment outside of, of course, Intel. The problem is it's not going to be released until 2016. At the earliest and it's most likely going to be 2017 from what we're hearing so I guess it's going to be dependent what I would really like my personal best case scenario and this is not 
anything else other than my hopes and dreams. I would really like it if Intel not necessarily lost to AMD, but were at least being really well challenged by AMD. And AMD grabbed a lot of the CPU market share back. Um, and I think that would force Intel to really push and add some additional CPU cores to their pro to their systems and really start to kickstart the desktop um, CPU race again. But that's just my opinion. Anyway, hopefully you've enjoyed the video. Uh, as I said, do check out the article which is linked in the video description if you do want to see the benchmarks for yourself or the results for yourself. Once again, their accuracy shrug. But let's, let's hope that they're... In the ballpark ish, or uh, let's even hope that you know the real results are slightly better. But anyway, take care and bye for now.